Welcome also from my side. Uh, my name is Hela Lichtenberg and I'm speaking today on behalf of ERANET Nuon Coordination Unit. In Nuon, we are very eager to overcome the gap between scientists, patients and lay people to increase transparency and credibility of science in society. That seems nowadays more important than ever. And therefore, it's a great pleasure uh, that you all gather to listen to the fourth issue already of our lay lecture series, which I'm happy to open with a brief intro to uh, Iranet Neuron. Uh, first off, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, please note that this lecture will be recorded and published. And for this reason, only the videos from the speakers will be visible during the entire webinar. You cannot switch on your camera or your microphone. We do have a question and answer session. And um, if you have a question, please type that in the uh, Q and A button that is in the bottom of your Zoom view. There's a specific um, section you open up, you type your question and we will read that out for you. Okay, Neuron is actually uh, an acronym and stands for New a Network of European uh, funding for neuroscience research. We are a network of 28 funding organizations <clears throat> who join forces to promote disease-related brain research. And over the past years, 50, past 15 years, 28 countries and the European Commission work together to follow this aim. Um, we focus our efforts on translational brain research. Translation in this context means the step where results from basic research, for example, in animal models, are results into clinical research approaches. This is a very critical step to bring new concepts and ideas for therapies and diagnostics to the clinical practice. This research on the threshold between basic and clinical research can address different fields of brain research. For example, neurological topics like head trauma, pain, stroke, epilepsy, or psychiatric disorders like depression, autism, um, or ADHD or schizophrenia, or overarching topics like the development of new methods or biomarkers. So how does that work? How do we fund research as a network of European funders? We launch each year an international or translational call for research proposals. For this, the funders agree on a topic that needs special focus. After this call is published, researchers can apply for funding with a few conditions. They work together with researchers from other countries and from a research consortium and they investigate the topic of the call. The research proposals are then evaluated by um, scientific, by patient and by ethical reviewers. The new one funders provide money for only the best projects addressing high important questions in the area of brain research. These calls for proposals are the central instrument in new one to promote brain research. And we are very successful with it. In the last 14 years, Nuon spent more than 160 million euros to fund 189 research consortia involving over 800 research groups. But besides that, Nuon has much more to offer. We lobby at the national and European level to promote new science and interconnect researchers and other stakeholders across Europe and beyond. We support young neuroscientists, for example, with our excellent paper write or with privileged access to high class trainings, workshops, poster sessions, and much more. And we want to interact with the society. That means we want to connect science closer to the society by engaging patients on every level, by providing YouTube educational video clips, informing the public via social media, and of course, by having lay lecture series. And with that, I'm already at the center of this event this afternoon and wish you all um, 
a nice lay lecture and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Hela. So it's now my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Pascal Der Kinderen. So Pascal Der Kinderen is a professor of uh, neurology. He earned his uh, uh, MD in neurology in uh, 1997, and then he obtained a PhD in molecular and cellular neuropharmacology in 1999 from Paris 6 University. Then he moved to uh, London to the Institute of Psychiatry, where he worked as a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of uh, uh, Professor Brian Underton. There he studied uh, the regulation of tyrosine phosphorylation of the microtubule associated protein tau, and uh, he identified a new tau kinase. He is currently a professor of neurology at Nantes University in uh, France, and uh, 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 he's uh, 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 seeing uh, patients uh, almost uh, uh, every day, and he's specialized uh, in the field of uh, Parkinson's disease. He's a leading uh, researcher, and he's leading a, a group of research in an INSEAM uh, unit. His research focuses on the interaction between the brain and the gut, especially in Parkinson's disease. And he has published more than 170 uh, scientific articles in uh, medical and scientific journal, and he's recipient of many prizes. Uh, today, we are privileged to uh, have him as a, a, a speaker, and he will give a lecture entitled it takes guts to sink. So thank you, Pascal, for accepting an, our invitation. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Etienne, for the kind introductions. Thank you, Ella, too. Just trying to share my screen, if it's OK. Uh, so again, thank you very much. I'm really happy to, to be here. So it takes guts to think what's uh, hidden behind uh, this title. Uh, act actually, it's going to be a bit challenging, but I will try during the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes to uh, give you an overview on our current knowledge, on what we know, but also on uh, uh, what we don't know on uh, the gut-brain axis. And maybe more generally speaking on, let's say, the because it's a new term, uh, microbiota gut-brain uh, uh, axis. Uh, it's always a bit boring, but we've, we, we have to start with, with something and with a definition. And uh, uh, as you will see, this concept of gut brain axis is, is still a bit blurry. It's, it's, it's defined, but it's still an evolving concept. But it is classically defined as a bidirectional communication system between the two organs involving uh, some uh, neural components that we will see called that kind. Of can call them hardwired uh, 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 anatomical components and also uh, uh, humoral uh, components. Uh, and this gut brain axis, of course, is cons consists of this hardwired and, and, and humoral components, and it's provided by the endocrine and immune system of the intestinal epithelium and uh, gut microbiota. But again, that's a definition and it's still moving, so, but uh, okay, we always have to start with something in life. Uh, it's a quite old concept, but it's really involving, and uh, we can say that it really uh, became trendy over the last maybe uh, 20, 25 years, uh, mainly because of the observation uh, showing that the gut microbiota uh, was is a key component of this gut-brain axis, and that the gut metabolites and the immune system could be also critically uh, uh, involved. So this gave maybe a new life to this uh, 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 gut brain uh, uh, axis. So uh, that's plan. Uh, uh, I will start with, of course, something I have, I have to, to describe the actors. And uh, so I will start by describing the, the components of the gut brain axis in the gut. What are the communicating pathways in the brain? I will... Uh, show you a few examples on um, the gut brain axis uh, uh, and, the, and the role of the gut brain axis under physiological conditions. 
And uh, the last part of the talk will be about uh, gut brain axis and our pathological uh, 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 foundations. So uh, maybe it's a bit, as I was saying, a bit oversimplified, but uh, uh, let's say that in the gut, there are roughly five components uh, that are, uh, as far as we know, uh, critical in the uh, gut brain axis. Uh, the first one is uh, the gut microbiota. The, um, the second one is, are the epithelial cells and the epithelial lining in the gut. The third one is the enteroantogrine cells. Fourth one, the neurons. And uh, the last one, the uh, uh, immune cells. So if we start with first one, the gut uh, uh, microbiota. As you know, it's very hype. And OK, everyone is focusing on uh, gut microbiota, but you will see that maybe also, maybe it's also could be also interesting to 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 have a look on on the nerves and and on the on, on the gut wall and not only on the on the gut lumen. Uh, you are all uh, aware of that. Our gut lumen is inhabited by trillions of bacteria. They are also virus and fungi. But uh, uh, to, to be honest, and 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 by far the bacteria has been widely studied, and it's a bit more difficult for virus and fungi. We know that this gut microbiome plays a very important role in our health because by helping control uh, to control digestion and benefiting our uh, immune systems. Uh, in contrast, what is uh, proposed is that an imbalance of uh, unhealthy and healthy uh, uh, microbes may be detrimental. Uh, and when a change uh, in gut composition occurs, we talk about gut dysbiosis. I'm not sure that the that's a proper name, but it's got this because it's uh, widely used. Uh, and maybe one critical point, I just want to emphasize, I would, I would say it again, but uh, the gut microbiota are able to exert its effects remotely via metabolites that will cross uh, the epithelial cell line. So the second uh, key component of the gut brain axis is the intestinal epithelium. This, this intestinal epithelium is a single cell layer that forms a luminal surface of uh, both the small intestine and colon. Also not the only one. It is definitely, um, uh, let's say, the main component of the intestinal epithelial barrier. And this barrier has two main functions. The first one is to um, uh, help to promote the absorption of useful substance, uh, 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 such as nutrients into the body. Uh, whereas the second one is instead to prevent the entry of arm, harmful stuff, uh, of harmful substance into the body. We know, and this is an important issue, is that this permeability is tightly regulated by small intercellular uh, locks. So you can just see them in green with uh, 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 high magnification. And... Uh, these intercellular locks are called uh, tight junctions, uh, and they just stitch together uh, these uh, epithelial cells. Uh, it is suggested that the dysfunction or dysregulation or downregulation uh, of uh, this, uh, of the proteins that uh, made up these uh, uh, tight junctions are uh, induces intestinal permeability what is also called leaky gut. So in, in many papers, what you're gonna see is just leaky gut. It uh, just means that uh, uh, gut is supposed to be uh, too porous or hyper permeable. But uh, uh, again, we will see that maybe it's not uh, that easy. The premise underlying this leaky gut is that the, uh, some physiological stressor, for instance, anxiety, anxiety, intensive exercise, or maybe gut pathogen could increase intestinal permeability. And then things, the entry of, of uh, bacteria or bacterial toxin into the systemic circulations and then leading to uh, uh, systemic inflammation or a more local form of, uh, of inflammation. The first component is uh, uh, the anti looking cells. Uh, there are quite new comments in the field. It's known for you, but uh, uh, there's been a growing interest in the anti looking cells over the last uh, 20, 15 years. Uh, these cells are quite rare. Uh, they are scatterly distributed uh, uh, along the anti entire uh, GI tract. Uh, and it's approximately 1% of the total gut uh, epithelium. Uh, and 
that's something that you can see as a picture taken from the lab. You've got the epithelium and then the small uh, yellow dot cells, these uh, scatterly distributed uh, cells. They are classically, classically regarded as uh, specialized or hormone secreting cells with an apical uh, surface that is directly, and that's quite critical, exposed to the gut lumen um, and uh, basal portions that uh, contains uh, some uh, secretory granules that the uh, enteroendocrine, uh, that the endocrine part of the uh, of the cells. Such an orientation allows uh, the enteroendocrine cells to respond to intraluminal signals, such as, for instance, nutrients or uh, microbiota derived uh, metabolites. And in turn, uh, this sensing will induce the release of the gut hormone, uh, which may uh, either have a local, uh, let's say, a local paracrine or uh, um, uh, uh, remote or systemic effect uh, called uh, uh, autocrine. Uh, we'll, sorry about that. We'll see later that uh, besides the endocrine properties, some new uh, studies have shown that these anti-endocrine cells also exhibit some neuronal features. I will uh, uh, come back in detail. Uh, the fourth component is uh, more for neurologists that the enteric neurons. Again, you're familiar with that. We do have neurons in, in our gut. A recent German paper, a very, very elegant paper from uh, Michael Chiman Group, showed that there are more than 150 millions of, of, of neurons embedded within our gut wall. And that's definitely more than in spinal cord. And it's uh, uh, as abundant as the spinal cord. Uh, that's a picture from the lab taken from a, a mouse colon and it's stained for, for, for neurons. And you see that these neurons are organized in ganglia with a mesh-like, web-like organization. Um, and um, we also know that these neurons, that's from the mountain plexus, are uh, um, uh, critically involved in the regulation of GI motility uh, and uh, um, um, secretions. Uh, one key point is that these anterior neurons are directly connected to neurons from the autonomic system, which are in turn uh, connected to uh, neurons of the CNS. So it means that after a few connections, you can get access from the gut uh, 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 to the brain, to the few synapses, uh, um, you can cross the border between the, uh, uh, the gut and the brain. Another important issue is that the anterior neuron, uh, uh, in contrast to anterior endocrine cells, are not in direct contact with the gut lumen. I just try to show this on the slide. Uh, and what we know is that the neuronal process are, uh, um, could be located uh, 20 to 30 micrometers from the gut lumen, but it's not in direct contact. So uh, we've got to keep this in mind. The last um, component, okay, let's say maybe not the last, but the last main component is immune cells. Uh, we all know that the human intestine is the largest immune organ of the body. Uh, it contains, and we all, now it's widely studied, it has been shown that um, the uh, um, gut wall contains a wide variety of uh, uh, immune cells. Um, it's always a bit delicate to me because I'm, I'm not an immunologist, so my message will be definitely maybe oversimplified. But maybe what we can say is that the key points are that gut contains some uh, uh, macrophages and some uh, dendritic cells, which can uh, recognize some of the microbiota derived metabolites and in turn either activate lymphocytes uh, or produce directly some inflammatory markers, uh, for instance, cytokines that could be also produced by uh, lymphocytes. So, all these uh, Im immune cells are likely to be critical uh, in the production of inflammatory uh, mediators and inflammatory uh, uh, markers. Of course, if we are talking about the gut point axis, we, we, we have to talk about the uh, possible connection between uh, linking uh, the brain and the gut and vice versa. Again, I just want to insist that it is supposed or likely that uh, all this communication has bidirectional with a top-down top down or bottom-up uh, uh, possibility. Uh, um, we can say that there are two main pathways that link the gut to the brain. Uh, again, these two pathways are bidirectional. One of these pathways uh, consists of some hardwired neuronal connection 
between the gut and the brain. Uh, this neuronal connection are part of the autonomic nervous system, and they are the so-called parasympathetic and sympathetic pathway. The sympathetic pathway connects the gut to the spinal cord, as you see there in blue, uh, while the uh, uh, parasympathetic pathway connects the gut to the base of the brain, to the brain stem, uh, and it's in uh, um, yellow. Uh, this, not surprisingly, this kind of pathway is primarily used, primarily used excuse me, by the um, uh, enteric neurons. I just mentioned earlier that you've got this direct contact between the enteric neurons and uh, uh, these two pathways. But it might also be used by the microbiota metabolites and by the enteric green uh, uh, cells. Um, <clears throat> the second pathway is in contrast to the first one, not a solid one. Uh, it's maybe we can call it the systemic, humoral, body fits related, I don't know how to say, uh, but it uh, uh, relies prim primarily on the release uh, of some uh, mediators from the gut into the bloodstream and then to the brain. Uh, this pathway is, is, maybe we don't know, but it doesn't seem to be widely used by new ones, but it's used, of course, by the immune cells with the release of cytokines of, or um, inflammatory markers by the anti kit cells or by the uh, microbiota uh, metabolites. Okay, I just realized that this may be a bit of a busy slide, but uh, anyway, just uh, I just wanted to maybe just to emphasize a bit more the neuronal pathways between the, um, the gut and the brain uh, because they are quite critical and I will come back on them later. So just uh, uh, to, 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 get, to get a bit, a bit deeper on the stuff. Uh, we know that uh, uh, all these sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are part of the autonomic nervous system, and that they regulate involuntary uh, uh, physiological processes such as heart rate, heart rate digestion, uh, respirations, and so on. Uh, there are three main uh, divisions. Uh, as already mentioned, the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and also the uh, enteric uh, uh, nervous system. Uh, we know that the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system are organized along two uh, 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 series of neurons with a preganglionic, there was a ganglion, so there was a preganglionic number one and a postganglionic fiber. And uh, uh, even if it's maybe again a bit too uh, uh, simplified, I think um, that the anterior nervous system can, can be regarded as a huge uh, uh, postganglionic uh, 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 network. So, what about the brain commodity? It's going to be the last part of the description and of of, of the um, uh, of the uh, um, anatomy. I'm sorry, it's a bit long, but we've got to talk about uh, uh, structures and regions in, involved because before talking. Uh, of pathology and, 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 and physiology. Uh, as you can easily guess, uh, many brain structures have been suggested to be involved in this gut-brain axis. And for um, the sake of clarity and shortness, uh, it is impossible to provide a comprehensive overview and I, I, I wouldn't be able to do so anyway. So just, uh, uh, but um, I think it's uh, impossible to not to mention the dorsal complex of the, of, of the vagus. This is a very small uh, uh, structure which contains a, a nucleus of the tractus solitarius and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. It's localized in the brainstem on the uh, first part of the brainstem called the medulla oblongata. Uh, and it's critical with what I mentioned before for the connection with the hard wire neuronal connection between uh, uh, the gut and, and uh, the brain because this small uh, region receive uh, um, some afferent fibers uh, from uh, the gut and then uh, uh, back some afferent fibers back to the gut. So it's quite critical for this uh, neuronal hardwire uh, connection. Regarding the homoral pathway, I mentioned earlier many structures have been uh, uh, suggested to be involved. Uh, in the response of um, the uh, immoral component of the gut brain axis. Uh, so I have just decided to cite two as just two examples among, uh, among many, but anyway, just to, uh, 
one, the first one is the uh, hypothalamus. You know that it's located at the base of the brain, that it controls body temperature, hunger, circadian cycles. And uh, it's frequently mentioned uh, because, of course, it connects the endocrine system to the nervous system. So it's uh, frequently mentioned in, uh, uh, in gut brain axis paradigm or experiments. Another frequently mentioned uh, brain region is uh, the insula. Uh, that's a brain region long known to be involved um, uh, with especially the interoceptive sensations. And uh, there seems to be a special interest for the insula in the gut brain axis. Just to uh, cite uh, an, an example, a recent paper is quite an intriguing study. They showed that the changes in the composition of the gut microbiota was associated with uh, the resting state of this insula in, in, in human, this was done with uh, a functional MRI. So it's quite, seems to be a, an important structure in this, uh, in the uh, gut brain uh, axis. So what does the gut brain axis uh, uh, does uh, uh, under physical co conditions? I guess a lot, there's quite a lot of stuff. Uh, again, I just uh, uh, decided to uh, uh, cite only three examples uh, for, for the sake of shortness, that's, that's it. But um, uh, one possibility, and uh, the first one is that uh, the informations come from the gut uh, to reach the brain, let's say in a, a bottom-up uh, fa fashion, it starts in the gut and then it's spread to uh, 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 to the brain. Uh, there is one recent, it was recently published, in one recent elegant paper showed that in mice, um, the uh, anteroendocrine cells that I mentioned before as a, maybe a key component of uh, the gut brain axis are only one connection away from the gut. Uh, I already mentioned that also, is that besides the endocrine features, these anti-endocrine cells um, uh, also uh, display some neuron-like features. Um, we know that they express some uh, key uh, neuronal uh, protein, especially uh, neurofilaments, and also some uh, uh, pre- and post-synaptic uh, protein. That's from the biochemical aspect, but also from a more morphological uh, standpoint, you see that these uh, cells uh, do have what is called a, a neuropod, and this neuropod is uh, uh, quite similar to a neuronal process seen uh, uh, in neurons. And it has been uh, uh, demonstrated that this neuropod comes in close contact to uh, the um, uh, anterior nerve, and that they can uh, come in close contact, and that they can uh, uh, sign it, sign, sign up. So. Uh, in, in a recent paper, what has been shown is that uh, gut luminal uh, signals, for instance, the presence of, 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 of sugar uh, in the gut lumen, uh, induce in milliseconds the release of um, glutamate, of the neurotransmitter glutamate, uh, by the EEC to directly activate the vagal neurons that will project to the small structure called the uh, dorsal complex uh, of the vagus. It's, quite remarkable because such a neuroepithelial circuit will connect the intestinal lumen to the brain stem with only one synapse. And then the brain will be able to sense what happens in the guts only uh, in uh, milliseconds. Second possibility, if it's not bottom up, it should be top down. It starts in the brain and it goes to the gut. Uh, so uh, that's very classical and uh, you know, it's known for years, but it's uh, quite important. You know that a uh, 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 well-known e example of the uh, peptic ulcers. Uh, if there is uh, some stress, you will be an increased secretion of uh, acid in the stomach via the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve. Uh, and um, this is exactly what, what, what happens with time. People are stressed. There's, there are some hypothalamic vagus connections. This will um, increase the cholinergic activity of uh, the vagus nerve, leading to more uh, acid secretion uh, in the stomach. 
and then to an erosion of the uh, mucosa and subsequently to a, a, a peptic ulcer. So the very classical aspect of the top-down star. Again, quite um, basic one, but it's an important one. Um, you have some top-down, bottom-up stuff, but of course, this could be also a loop and a, a closed circle with some information coming from the gut to the brain and, and, and back from the brain uh, 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 to the gut. To the gut. Uh, sorry. This is uh, especially the case for the vagovagal reflex in which both afferent and efferent fibers of the vagus will coordinate the uh, response to gut stimuli uh, via the dorsal vagal complex of the brain. In this reflex, for, um, what is nice is that um, so you eat. That's okay. I just choose a burger. Maybe it's not the right thing for you. Best choice, but anyway, so you eat your burger, and uh, just arriving uh, when the food will just arrive in uh, um, in the stomach, this will lead to uh, an activation of the uh, uh, mechano uh, receptors of the of stomach, and then this will activate the vagus uh, vagus afferent fibers, saying, "Hey, just." Uh, Food is arriving, food, food, food is coming, you've got to do something. And then, uh, so it goes up to uh, the brainstem, again, to the dorsal motor complex of the vagus, and that the efferent response back to the stomach, this uh, 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 motor fibers say, okay, cool, there's some food. If you want that everything is uh, uh, works fine, you've got to relax the stomach and it leads to muscle. Uh, relaxations. Of course, you can easily understand that if it's interrupted, if it doesn't work, it's going to be a cause of uh, of bloating uh, and uh, uh, vomiting. So uh, I kept this aside at the moment, but I mentioned in the introduction that the uh, gut brain uh, that the gut microbiota could be, uh, let's say, a game changer in the gut brain axis and the story of the gut brain axis. And, and now we are uh, talking about uh, more frequently about the microbiota or the immune microbiota gut brain uh, axis. So how do we reconcile the possible what role of gut microbiota with the other members of the team? It is mainly suggested that the gut microbiota mediate its effect not directly, but via um, its uh, uh, metabolites. And for instance, such as short chain fatty acids, for instance, beauty rat, that are able to cross the two barriers, not only the intestinal epithelial barrier, but also the uh, blood brain uh, BBB, the blood brain barrier. This uh, metabolite, metabolites can change uh, the activity of the nearby enteric neurons, and the message can be transmitted through uh, the hardwire. Uh, uh, connections that I already mentioned. And alternatively, these metabolites may also enter the bloodstream and mediate the effect uh, remotely. Uh, there's a systemic humoral uh, effect. So uh, it's gonna be the last part of, um, of the presentation. Uh, that was classical aspect with some uh, uh, a bit of physiology, anatomy, and uh, what does this good brain axis uh, does in, in, in physiology, but it's time to move to, uh, to, to, to pathology. Um, so I'm, I'm not a gastroenterologist, so <laughs> tricky to, to talk about that, but it's impossible, I think, if we, if we talk about pathology and the good brain axis, it's not possible, not, it's impossible not to mention the uh, high BS, the uh, irritable bowel syndrome, um, uh, because um, it is supposed, and I think it's, it's, it's clear, that it's a prototypical uh, gut brain axis disorders. From a clinical standpoint, it is very frequent, as you see, maybe 10 to 15% of the general population. And it is characterized by abdominal pain, by bloating, by an alternance of diarrhea and constipation, and by some fluctuations. Sometimes people are pretty well for a few weeks, and then you've got some relapse, and it's good. That's, there are now strong evidence to suggest that this, uh, uh, that IBS is not only a gut disorder, but that it is also 
uh, brain disorders um, because several studies performed in human and modern shows that IBS is associated with comorbid anxiety and depression and uh, also more stress and that connections between the brain and the gut are dysfunctional in uh, uh, subjects with IBS. But there's still remain to be determined what comes first. This is chicken or egg. Does the gut uh, drive the uh, associated anxiety or does the uh, or, um, does everything start uh, in the brain leading to uh, the uh, visceral hypersensitivity? We, I think we still don't know. It's a bit less known, but there is also, as you, as you might know, a growing interest in the possible role of the gut-brain axis uh, in uh, uh, psychiatric uh, uh, disorders, and especially depression. There is a growing amount of literature on the topic, but I just choose to show one of the, uh, I think it's a nice paper, a French one, uh, which suggests that the gut microbiota that both the gut microbiota and the vagus nerve are critically involved in the depression. So uh, in a nutshell, what is, uh, is that a subgroup of mice were chronically stressed and their feces were collected. They just extracted the supernatant of these feces that were transferred to the yellow one to some normal mice, that I know. After a few weeks, these uh, uh, mice developed behavior that were highly reminiscent of uh, anxiety and depression, together with some stigmata of uh, brain inflammation. And quite remarkably, uh, all this uh, 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 behavioral and pathological features were prevented by uh, vacotomy. So this uh, suggests that both gut microbiota and vagus, vagus nerve could be critically involved in uh, uh, the uh, genesis of, of, of depression or depressive disorder. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit more my stuff. So this may sound a bit more uh, surprising to you, but Parkinson's disease, uh, that's a neurological disorder, uh, as you know, is also uh, likely to be a gut-brain axis uh, uh, disorder. You are all familiar with that, but just have to, to very short reminder. Parkinson's disease is classically uh, seen and, and described as a movement disorder of the brain with a loss of dopamine secreting neurons in the midbrain, along with the presence of uh, intraneuronal inclusions in the remaining surviving neurons uh, uh, called Lewy bodies. That's a classical aspect of Parkinson's disease for a clinical and pathological uh, uh, standpoint. Uh, but we know now that it has become now obvious, it's more 20 or so, yeah, over the last 20 years, it has now become obvious that PD is not only a brain disorder, but also a gut disorder. Um, the same lesions and so, those observed in the brain, these uh, Lewy bodies, are also observed in the uh, GI tract and more precisely in the anterior neurons. That's a picture from the lab, you see, you've got the... Uh, uh, that's a neuron from the myotic plexus. Thibault Bouvier and Alain Pouclet uh, perform the, the, the staining of the patient with PD. And you see that we've got uh, an inclusion. This looks, it's not the same, of course, because techniques were a bit different. But you see, you've got a very nice inclusion in the uh, uh, gut of a, a subject with, uh, a PD, with PD. Uh, and we also know that its lesions in the gut are accompanied by GI symptoms, such as constipation, which could be uh, not only debilitating, but really frequent in PD. So not only a brain, but also a enteric nervous system uh, disorder. We also know that the brain and the gut are not the only components of the gut-brain axis to be uh, uh, affected in PD. Uh, there are some changes in the, gut, in the composition of the gut microbiota uh, in uh, 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 PD uh, uh, subjects. There are now, uh, I didn't count exactly, but there are more than 20 case control studies on the composition of gut microbiota in PD sub subjects with a comparison between PD subjects and the control po populations is uh, what we call case control studies. All of these studies, I think without any exception, uh, show differences between PD and controls 
and some uh, have uh, suggest suggested that it still remains to be to be proven that uh, uh, PD uh, patients may have a more aggressive inflammatory profile in the gut, um, and that it, that it may facilitate the disease initiation. We will we, we'll talk about that. And the second important point is that you know this famous dorsal vagal uh, complex is affected by uh, the uh, pathological process in PD in almost all PD patients, the vast majority of PD patients, uh, uh, with the presence of uh, uh, Lewy bodies and Lewy pathology in this. Uh. So uh, this has this led to many suggestions and uh, hypotheses. I'm just showing you uh, uh, what is the uh, uh, current proposed scenario, but you will see that there are some shortcuts and, and, and limitations. But what is suggested in most reviews is that uh, uh, things should, may start in the gut lumen, that the gut may uh, play uh, a, a role in the development of, of the disease. Um, so might, might start, suggested it might start in the gut, with some uh, chill or let's say uh, and non-inflammatory microbiota becoming for an unknown reason, we still don't know, uh, 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 an activated uh, or uh, with a pro-inflammatory profile uh, microbiota. This in turn would, uh, this inflammation would lead to uh, uh, an increase, what I mentioned before, in the intestinal permeability, what is called leaky gut, uh, allowing the passage of uh, microbiota metabolites with the humoral uh, uh, pathway, so into the bloodstream, that could reach the brain and modify uh, modifying the uh, uh, inflammatory status and the function of the brain. Or the second possibility is that uh, after uh, uh, this, uh, when the gut gets more porous, is that the toxic substance, a pathogen from the gut lumen, could reach the enteric neurons and then leading to local pathology that would subsequently spread to uh, uh, the vagus nerve in four uh, uh, to reach the brain. That's quite tempting, you see, because it's quite straightforward. You've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, but maybe six, and you say, okay, it's done. Maybe we don't have to do uh, any more research on Parkinson's disease. But uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, it's definitely a bit too uh, simplistic. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, and just to... Uh, 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 among many uh, uh, shortcuts and, and, and limitations of uh, things, we, I think we, we should still uh, remain cautious because there are still some outstanding questions. The first one, you know, in all this scenario, what you've got is it's okay, it's quite obvious you've got a leaky gut in PD, and we've got to bear in mind that all this uh, assumption or this uh, premise relies only on one paper that was published uh, 12 years ago. And uh, there was only nine PD subjects, sub subjects who were analyzed for gut permeability. And uh, so quite critical, it's uh, only one team and it has never been uh, reproduced independently so far. And it's the same for GI inflammation. I won't go into details, but David DeVos in the lab was the first to show very basic stuff. He showed uh, 10 years ago that if you take some uh, uh, biopsy samples from PD subjects, you've got uh, um, uh, an increased expression levels of, of some inflammatory markers in, in, in the gut of uh, the colon of PD subjects quite compared to controls. But uh, we try to reproduce and it works sometimes, but it's a divergent. And there was a strong overlap between some PD subjects and, and controls. Uh, quite a lot to be done on GI inflammation. So you see at least two uh, uh, outstanding qu questions that need to be uh, to be resolved before going to such uh, a simplistic uh, scenario. Uh, I'm almost done. Yes, just one, one point, because I mentioned that and it's, it's very trendy. So I've got to talk about it. Uh, I, I talked about the anti-endocrine cells. Um, you know, they are now supposed to be some key player, uh, and not supposed, they are likely to be some key player on the gut brain axis. And uh, I show you some stuff on the physiology with this direct connection with, with neurons and with neuronal properties. And we know now, is that some recent publication, one from the lab and one from uh, Roger Lidl's lab. And uh, we showed that uh, uh, these cells express both alpha synuclein and tau, two key proteins in the development of Parkinson's disease. So 
what is proposed, but again, it has to be proven, is that uh, because these cells do express tau and alpha synuclein, they should be able to transmit the pathology between the gut lumen to the anterior neurons with this direct contact. And uh, this uh, allows you to bypass the intestinal epithelium. So I've just only one or two slides. So if I just try to summarize, it's a, um, of course, you know, it's a very, uh, it's a trending topic, maybe a bit, a bit too trendy, but that's it. Uh, again, I think we've got to remain cautious, but it is likely in, involved in many uh, GI and brain disorders. Uh, I hope I was able, able to uh, show you that it's a complex, moving, evolving concept with many actors. And maybe uh, if, I had, if I have to do this talk again in five years, it's going to be completely different. I don't know, but uh, uh, microbiota and maybe the immune system uh, could be some game, game, game ch changers. Uh, uh, but maybe uh, again, I think we, we should remain, we, we remain cautious. I think if you have a look on PubMed, for instance, if you look on, on, on papers on, on the gut point axis, the majority of these papers are uh, reviews papers and hypothesis papers. There are quite few original papers and quite surprisingly. So uh, I think we need a bit more, uh, uh, let's say original studies and not only say, okay, it's likely to occur like that and so that. And maybe another uh, key issue is that, I don't know if it's a great majority, but quite a lot of findings uh, uh, have been obtained and relies on, 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 the, on the animal models and the wardens. And especially on the use of uh, germ-free mice. Germ-free mice is uh, uh, mice without any gut mi microbiota. Okay, so say, okay, it might be interesting and maybe interesting for the proof of concept, but we're not mice. And I think it's quite a, a, a weird situation uh, uh, not to have any microbiota. So just to mention uh, uh, work, for instance, I think we, we need more studies in, in human. And, uh, Sorry about that. We did more study in human, and just to uh, show uh, uh, very interesting work. For instance, just Per Borgamer is in Aarhus in Denmark, and Per was the first one to uh, show that it was possible to analyze the uh, vagus nerve uh, in living subjects using some uh, um, uh, new imagery uh, uh, techniques. He was able to show and to find a new uh, way using uh, donepezil as a marker. And you see, he showed some uh, uh, denervation and dysfunctional vagus in PD. But you can use uh, this approach uh, uh, in living subjects uh, for uh, any reasons. If you want to do some research on IBS, okay, just uh, so I, I think it's a good example of what we. Uh, should tend to do a bit more human, uh, uh, a little bit less wooden. So, Etienne, you can mention that, okay, we are from Nantes, that's a collaboration between our know, Astrolab, our department, Nantes University. You already see the pictures of some former PhD students of the lab who did some, uh, we are not only some very nice person, but uh, we did some tremendous work, and our sponsor. I hope I was not too long. Just, just a bit. I'm sorry about that, but it's, uh, I'm done. Th thank you very much, Pascal, for uh, sharing uh, all this uh, data with us. As you said, the topic is uh, very trendy. It's, uh, uh, and uh, that's why we choose this topic within uh, uh, Aeronet Neuron. So maybe you can uh, unshare your screen. Okay. I would like just to remind yeah. the audience that you can... Uh, ask your question through the Q and uh, R button. And uh, we have already some uh, questions uh, coming. So I will start with some uh, 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 first uh, uh, questions. You, you, you discussed, of course, the microbiota, the, 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 the relationship with brain diseases. And we, we see on internet and in shops, uh, uh, many compounds that are supposed to modify the microbiota. Uh, wh what we sh should we think about all this? First, uh, is it uh, 
uh, dangerous too? Is it doing anything? Can we prevent some uh, uh, brain disorders with this? Or uh, what, what's your opinion in uh, manipulation of this system? Because uh, for the, the lay audience, it's very important. We see advertisement for this uh, everywhere. At the end, you're absolutely right. And it seems because it seems so quite, quite, quite easy to handle. You just buy the stuff. And you think that's going to do some uh, good stuff into into your belly and your gut lemon, and it's done. Uh, I think that you already know the answer. I, I will be definitely cautious about that because uh, you can say, okay, you can just buy some pre or probiotics. This could be uh, either some uh, oligosaccharides or, or, or bacteria. But uh, there are some studies. Uh, alors, again, it is mice. This is not in human, but show that if you uh, uh, that some of the uh, uh, probiotics could be harmful to uh, uh, mice with colitis. So, uh, uh, from my point of view, I would be really cautious. And 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 again, to be honest, we don't know what we do. Uh, I, I'm not a microbiologist, but uh, let's say from a clinical standpoint, it seems to be a bit of a nightmare. This analysis of the of the microbiota, and we don't know what we have to correct most of the people that who says okay it's fine you've got to change your the composition of the uh, microbiota in uh, of your gut say okay uh, um, uh, it works really well with some clostridium difficile colitis it means that when you've got some uh, very uh, uh, strong uh, depopulation of uh, your gut bacteria with antibiotics you just do some uh, uh, fecal transplanted and people are, are getting better. But it's a very drastic condition. When I talk about maybe depression, Parkinson's disease, stuff like that, this is only some subtle change in the composition of, uh, um, uh, um, uh, of the uh, gut microbiota. And to be perfectly honest, I think we don't know what we have to correct and what we have to do better. So I, it's really tempting, uh, but I, I, I would be really cautious. You you mentioned uh, uh, fecal transplant. Do you think that uh, there is room for uh, some use of this for uh, brain disorders? I heard some colleagues saying that for uh, multiple sclerosis, yes. it might be a way. It's uh... yeah, it's yeah, already so... done. It's already done, and it is with close relatives from the same family. It's already working. It's used in the clinics. Yeah. There are also some protocols for Parkinson's disease, as, as you know, Etienne, and it's uh, uh, one in, I think, one in uh, Belgium, in Gand, and the second one in Helsinki with Philippe Skeperians. As, as, uh, but again, I had a talk with Philippe Skeperians uh, uh, 10 days ago, and I said, oh, so how, how do you select your, your subjects? Because um, that's something I don't have time to mention, but uh, do you, should you try to uh, and propose the stuff to any PD patients? Uh, do you have to set, let's say, uh, an inflammatory testing of, of the stools and of them? Um, so I don't know. So, well, why not? But uh, again, I'm a bit perplexed. And uh, I'm also a bit perplexed. And uh, you know this definitely better than, than me, that if you take PD, for instance, it's a very slow progressive disorder. And I'm quite a bit perplexed about uh, performing uh, FMT. And this uh, uh, fecal transplant after 10 or 15 years of, of disease, of symptomatic disease, as it's maybe uh, 20 or 30 years of disease. So again, I will be a bit cautious. Yeah. Hela, would you like to have some question from yes, the I chat? have just, thank you very much. I would just, just like to ask one from my side. Um, Pascal, is there a map of, let's say, the core bacterial genera taxa, um, something like a universal health map of the taxa that are inhabiting the gut? I think so, but uh, I'm sorry about that. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a microbiota specialist, but I think there are some stuff from INRA, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. should be. So I read out now the questions. So first question, could, could improving metabolic status of gut microbiota suppress the dysbiosis 
existing, for instance, in case of IBS? There are some studies showing that it might be promising and, 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 and that this would be a, a shift into a more uh, healthy uh, microbiota. It seems to work. At least it's supposed to be uh, maybe one good, um, uh, I would be a bit more optimistic for this kind of disorder. Okay. Uh, second question, is depression a malfunctioning of the gut brain axis or strictly a brain, uh, brain related only? That's a very good question. There are, there, this is what I mentioned. There seems to be a few things on the gut brain axis in depressions, but uh, it's still on a very early stage. Uh, what we know is that, I'm, I'm quite sure about that, some, uh, there have been some studies on the composition of the gut microbiome between subjects with uh, uh, mild or severe depression mm. compared to controls, and there are some changes. Uh, uh, regardless of the of the treatment of 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 of, of the depressions, so there might be something. But I think that if we want to show that uh, depression is definitely a gut brain axis disorder, we've got to go beyond the gut microbiota. I think it's not enough. And mm -hmm. uh, I hope I was able to uh, maybe not convince, but to show you that there are uh, many other elements in the gut brain axis pathways and the gut microbiota, and so. I think just talking about uh, the guts uh, and, and the gut microbiota is, uh, is, 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 is not enough. Okay, thank you very much. Next question, what is the role of food in all this? Oh, food. Uh, <laughs> well, so, uh, I, I don't know what to answer. I, I think it's quite obvious, no? Yeah. <laughs> uh, just uh, just um, if you... You, what people say, you are what you eat. So if you if you uh, if you able to uh, identify something in your gut lumen that you uh, should be able to change, maybe it could be modified so by gut habits, uh, by gut uh, habits. Uh, but uh, okay, so okay. So uh, uh, just Pascal to follow up on this, do we have differences for for instance? Uh, across uh, continents where the food habits are different. And uh, uh, this would have a major impact on the uh, study of different diseases because if food or food habits uh, 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 change, uh, the, the, the whole uh, brain gut uh, axis, uh, you, yeah. you, you might influence also the disease progression. Etienne, you're absolutely right. And, and there might be, of course, and this could be also one of the limitations of this study, because of course, when we try to uh, summarize or to do a meta-analysis of uh, the existing studies on uh, a disorder, it could be Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, anyway, if I just uh, something from the gut brain axis, there are many differences uh, in the uh, gut microbiota compositions between, uh, let's say, African, uh, no, it's not enough, but uh, for instance, Chinese, Yes. Uh, and North American people. So it's quite difficult to uh, uh, summarize all these findings. This it might explain why they are sometimes a bit uh, uh, difficult to reconcile uh, and everything. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I, there are more ongoing studies on the topic, uh, I know, but I think it's going to take time before we will be able to do any definitive conclusions with that, uh, I guess. Okay, thank you. So there's another question from um, one of the audience. A recent paper shows that there are circadian fluctuations of gut microbiota composition. It changes in the same person depending on when you do the analysis. Could that explain overlaps between patients and controls? And should trials and analysis be done differently? Very good questions. Uh... There are only a few papers who just uh, uh, did uh, the sampling uh, at the same time during the day. And this is the next step, but, but it's right. This may lead to some confusion. It's a very good question, yeah. Okay, next question is the connectivity pattern, the functional and the anatomical between the brain and the gut homogeneous along the gut axis. Wow, I don't know, to be perfectly honest. I don't know what that is. It's a tough question. It's a, uh, mm. uh, uh, I don't know if it's a or not. Oh, I don't, 
sorry about that, but okay, just, uh, I don't know. Okay. And um, perhaps last question from this side, can you comment on some new molecules that act on, reduce in brackets, tau or alpha synuclein aggregates in the intestine do not pass the intestinal barrier, so do not reach the blood or the brain, but may have an effect on brain functions. Wow. Uh, for example, and one reduces constipation yes, yes. and may reduce dementia and hallucinations in PD patients. Absolutely right. There is this paper released by an American team uh, showing that uh, a compound that is able to inhibit alpha synuclein uh, 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 aggregation in the gut is also able to uh, uh, do something in the brain with uh, people uh, that this uh, ENS1, ENS01 uh, uh, compound. And it worked in preclinical models, and there have been a, uh, a studies um, um, in uh, people with Parkinson's disease, and it uh, did better than, than placebo. And uh, of course, it worked on constipation, but uh, people were also a bit better uh, uh, on the uh, motor scales of, of, of the disease. Uh, seems to be promising, but again, needs to be replicated. And also maybe the study was a bit uh, underpowered to be, uh, it was mm -hmm. also center, so the one center or just a few centers in the US. So uh, seems, to be careful. To be no, no. It's, it's quite uh, really interesting, but of course, it's uh, it, it's just like the stuff about the leaky gut. Ella, when I mentioned, okay, you know, when you read some papers on the leaky gut, there's some leaky gut in PD. But if you have if you have a careful look on the stuff, only one paper. So it's a very the one with the ENS O one as mentioned by on the question is very interesting, but again, need to be replicated more people and just uh, uh, just to be it's also small effect. So by this, we have to uh, close this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Pascal, for uh, accepting uh, our uh, uh, invitation. Sorry for those who ask some questions that uh, could not be answered because of uh, lack of time. And uh, I would like again, uh, thank uh, Aranet Neuron for organizing this and thank uh, our colleagues behind the scene from uh, Israel, from Spain, from Germany, and from France who made this possible. Also, thank you very much. Many, and many thanks. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Nice evening. Bye-bye.